We are only a few weeks into the new year, but already as some of the main technology events of this month, scientists and business leaders are anticipating advancements in AI that will make current LLMs look like vintage items. Jensen Huang was the first during CES to anticipate the upcoming improvements. Um, very, very soon, uh, we're going to have a continuous AI that's going to be with you. And when you use those meta glasses, uh, you could, of course, uh, point at something, look at something and, and ask it, you know, whatever information you want. And so the thing that we would like to do is we would like to have in the future your AI basically become your AI assistant. Then there was Julie Sweet, CEO of Accenture. And one of the big trends we talk about are robotics, which I think are super exciting. And if you're walking the floor, you've seen there's so many different manifestations in health and wellness. I mean, it's it's really incredible what's happening there. But it's, it's you know, really a breakthrough moment for physical AI. In the second part of the month, it was Demis Hassabis, co-founder and chief executive officer at Google Mind, a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry in 2024. Asabis was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland, and here is what he had to say about the near future. The big uh, advances people are expecting in the general AI space are agent-based systems, mm -hmm. systems that are able to kind of um, complete tasks on their own mm -hmm. on behalf of the user. Um, I think it's going to be interesting bringing that towards science, um, but I think uh, AI applied to science is a lot richer than just the language models and things like AlphaFold. These are kind of bespoke models that are built using the same principles uh, as the general models, but are then applied specifically to particular domains. Um, and I hope, uh, I mean, we're work, we and others are working on uh, trying to design drugs uh, with AI. And I think um, with our little spin out company, Isomorphic, uh, I think we're, we'll, we'll hopefully have some AI designed drugs in the clinic, clinical trials by the end of the year. That's the plan. Hassabis was on stage with Arden Pataputian, neuroscience professor at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who also won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2021. Both scientists were interviewed by Alison Snyder, managing editor at Axios. The speed at which things are moving in AI is very evident in the scientific world. Studies that used to take five years to carry out can potentially be done in months or even weeks. This is thanks to AlphaFold, the artificial intelligence program which performs predictions of protein structure. More than 2 million scientists that use AlphaFold are now contributing to developing new drugs, even customized for the single individual. Let's listen in the words of Hassabis. Like, you know, I've always thought, can you do the search part of biology or, or, or you know, the, the, the experimental sciences in silico? Right, that's the thing that takes all the time. And then the final step, of course, you still need to validate it in the wet lab, right? Or do a clinical trial or whatever it is to make sure that your model prediction is correct, because it's not always correct. Um, and, uh, but that could, you know, if that works in, in general, that could save you 10x, 100x of the time and cost, right? C clearly with virtual screening, things like that. Um, and the number I always like to give is that not only did we, you know, you can fold a, obviously a protein and, and get the structure in a few seconds, but we, so we ended up folding all of them, 200 million known to science. Mm -hmm. So that would have taken, you know, like a rule of thumb of like a billion years of PhD time because five years per protein. And so it's kind of mind blowing really how much faster that could be. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm thinking is that's not the only, of course, for drug discovery or something like that, that's just one piece of the puzzle, right? Like knowing the 3D structure of the protein. Um, and so then I was sort of thinking, why can we revolutionize the whole of the drug discovery process? You know, bring it down from many, many years, a decade or something to do with the, you know, the average time it takes to go from target to a, a candidate and put it into the clinic. And um, why can we get that down to maybe, um, you know, months or weeks, right? The same kind of acceleration we saw with the structures part. And so that's what we've been working on now, you know, sort of, um, you've got the structure, now can you design a chemical compound? Mm -hmm. So we're sort of moving into chemistry that binds to the right part of um, the protein surface but also, importantly, doesn't bind to anything else. Right. So you can do a virtual screen for not only, you know, I want the most potent thing to bind to, 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 the, to the target in question, but I want it to be really clean drug that doesn't bind to anything else in the body. Um, and I think eventually you could imagine personalized medicine where it's optimized um, maybe like overnight by an AI system for your per personal metabolism uh, to, to, be, to be perfect for, for you. And so then in more general fundamental biology, I think 
uh, the way we're thinking about it, and you see that with AlphaFold 3, our work there is moving up the interaction stack. Mm. So if you think of AlphaFold 2 as essentially cracked the picture of a static protein, mm. um, but biology is not static. All the interesting things are when there's dynamics and interactions happen. And AlphaFold 3 is the first sort of next step on that, where it's got pairwise interactions. You know, a protein interacting with another protein, or a protein interacting with a ligand, or a protein interacting with RNA, DNA. Mm. And then, you know, then you might think about a pathway, and then eventually, um, my dream would be to simulate a virtual cell. If science provides a reference framework, we can expect solutions that we can't even imagine now. This is exactly what happened when AlphaGo played Go with the world champion and they came up with moves that were not part of the arsenal of the game, even though it has been around for over a thousand years. The first thing is acceleration of by 10x, 100x of many of a lot of the painstaking uh, uh, experimental work potentially. Um, but uh, I think there's also the potential for these systems to discover new areas. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, invent true invention is not possible yet with AI. Like it can't come up with a new hypothesis or a new conjecture. It can maybe solve a complicated, say, conjecture in maths. I think we're very close to, to, to some big breakthroughs in, in, mm -hmm. in that front. I think we'll see that this year. Um, but that's different from actually coming up with the, right. the, the theory or the hypothesis as the best you know human scientists do. Um, but there might be more uh, 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 brute force uh, uh, ways of doing that. You know, you could imagine a system that um, maps out the current knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but also understands when it's at the at the leaf nodes, I call it, of the of the existing knowledge, right? And then you could do a sort of search process from there and get to a new part of the of the search space that has not been explored yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and and examples of that are uh, with our program AlphaGo, mm -hmm. which which you know while, uh, beat the world champion sort of famously at Go Lisa Doll in in 2016 and kind of was part of creating the modern boom that we see in AI today, sort of coming of age, if you like. It not only did it win that match, but it came up with creative moves that had never been seen before, even though we played Go for thousands, thousands of years, hundreds of years and a couple of thousand years now. And uh, and I can imagine that was, was, was incredible to me because that would be so useful in science to be able to discover sort of, you know, new parts of the of the, of the, of the search space. Um, so I can see kind of techniques like that being able to be extended into some areas of science at least. Next, Hasabis discusses the progress in understanding brain activity, specifically how neural firing and connectivity translate into actions and thoughts. These concepts are often mentioned when Elon Musk and his team discuss Neuralink. However, in this case, Hasabis explains how advanced algorithms are so intelligent that they don't even require linguistic knowledge, or the complex rules proposed by earlier theories, such as those put forward by luminaries like Noam Chomsky. I think it's, I think it's we're early days about what it's telling us about the brain and, and specifically neuroscience data, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few surprising things, I think, on, on our journey over the last 15 years in, in, in doing AI research is um, that these, these, I would say, relatively uh, uh, simple type of algorithmic ideas in the end, like back propagation, reinforcement learning, these sorts of things, ended up scaling to something that's pretty impressive, you know, the kind of multimodal foundational models you see today, uh, without too many specialized systems. Mm -hmm. Maybe it had to be like that if you think about it. Biology is, you know, evolved and is from simple components. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, simple and elegant components. Yeah. So perhaps that's how it had to be. Um, I think that the, the simpler, the, the biggest surprise to me is the way that language is being cracked, right, mm -hmm. without the explicit need for concepts or other things that a lot of neuroscientists perhaps uh, thought would be necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you go to some of the famous people at MIT, like Chomsky, and mm -hmm. the, the kind of old school of thinking about la language systems as sort of like logic systems, innate to, to the brain, it doesn't seem, I, I, I feel like that needs to all be updated in, this, mm -hmm. in a sense, linguistics, um, neurolinguistics, and how um, the brain acquires language and, and concepts. Um, it seems that there's, there's, you know, from experience, it kind of just happens naturally from, right. from, from like being immersed in it. Um, perhaps like a child is, or the way that we're, we're training these, um, these large models, language models. Earlier at CES, Jensen Wang in his keynote speech talked about the rise of digital agents. He also discussed how these agents can be trained with video. This is an idea that was developed by Jean LeCun of Meta and that we have presented in several videos on this channel. Now, 
If you want people, uh, systems like this to understand how the world works, why don't you do this with videos? You know, it's new, new architectures, right? So getting machines to understand how the world works by basically watching video. Asabis seems to agree with this idea. Here is why. That was another, I think that was another hypothesis was that uh, there's this whole branch of neuroscience called action in perception. Mm -hmm. So with this idea is you can't actually, in some sense, really perceive the world fully uh, and, and model the world, the physics of the world, let's right. say, without acting in it. Right. And, and the canonical examples were like, you know, the, the understanding of weight. Right. Uh, you know, you kind of need to really act in the world to sort of get a true understanding of things like uh, uh, weight and the, and the physicalness uh, of the world. But it, but it turns out it seems like you can you can potentially learn that just from you know language and 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 and, and videos mm -hmm. right so passive observation mm -hmm. um, of course I think the systems will and, and of course that's what agent based systems are, are going to be about this year which is acting in the world right. as well and then I think we will get even more intelligent systems um, and then they will be useful for things like robotics um, but it, I don't think it's necessary it doesn't seem like it's necessary to acquire intelligence and in talking about new tools developments and new applications we can't exclude that we might even unveil new forms of intelligence. Let's take a listen. The reason that we, we, we uh, and, and my co-founder Shane Legg, our chief mm -hmm. scientist, are coined the term artificial general intelligence actually back in mm -hmm. sort of around 2000, the reason we sort of use human intelligence as a yardstick is the only example we have of general intelligence potentially in the universe, mm -hmm. right? So we've, you know, it's, a, it's a very special data point, mm -hmm. let's call it, in the search space of intelligence. Probably not the only way to build uh, general, a general intelligence. You know, eventually when we un start understanding intelligence at a more fundamental level, there'll be other, probably other architectures that could deliver that. Mm -hmm. And maybe AI will, will go down a different route eventually. Um, but initially, that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the only evidence we have of that. What I actually think about more is more um, the theoretical Turing machines. You know, my all-time heroes, Alan Turing, kind of proved that the, the, the Turing machine, which is the basis of all modern computers, can, in theory, model anything that's computable mm. in the world. And so, and the brain is probably a type of Turing machine. Mm. And um, so, if we can simulate the, the, the cognitive capabilities of uh, that humans have, then in, in this totality, then you know you have uh, a Turing powerful system, which means, in theory, it could compute anything. Mm.